the Diocese of El Paso, Texas. The story of the faith in this region began with the labors of Spanish missionary priests, was sustained and nurtured by holy bishops, and carries on today under the leadership of its current apostle, Bishop Mark Seitz. Love conquers. Hating people back will not resolve this issue. There is a wonderful, deep, and I think fundamentally Christian sense that uh, this has to be the answer. This is the story of the bishops of America, the shepherds of the past and the shepherds of today, who through their callings and ministry carry the church into the future. It's also the story of their parish, their church, the cathedral. This is the chair an exploration of what it means to be an apostle in America. On the far western corner of the Lone Star State, overlooking the Rio Grande is the city of El Paso, sea city of the Diocese of El Paso. I had a sense that this is a very special place, even before I really got to know it. Economically, we uh, are one of the poorest regions in the country. Because we're on the border, it, it offers special challenges. It's just a rich mix, a place of encounter, not of conflict, a place where people love to see that they see themselves as receiving uh, and look at people that are not from here. Uh, we have Fort Bliss, 30,000 people working there, people coming from all over the country. And they all, I think, shortly after they arrive, they feel like they're home. I feel like God has just done something wonderful in my life to allow me to serve the Diocese of El Paso. El Paso, as with much of what is now the southwestern United States, was mission territory throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Well, unlike most of the other Spanish-founded colonial-era missions, however, the missions of El Paso, remarkably, continue to function as the religious and social centers of their communities. This makes these Catholic missions the oldest settled areas of the city of El Paso and some of the oldest settlements in the United States. The church has been here in El Paso longer than anywhere else in Texas and longer than in most of the United States. The first Catholic mass was celebrated here in 1598. And the first Catholics, the converted Pueblo Indians, had come down here during the Pueblo Revolt with the Franciscan friars in 1680 and established mission churches that exist today. When I say churches, I mean mission communities that have been there steadily all the way through. It's just a fascinating, unique place on earth. The Diocese of El Paso is home to the three oldest missions in the United States, Yesleta Mission, Socorro Mission, and San Elizario Mission. All three are Texas historic sites included in the National Register of Historic Places and certified by the National Park Service. The missions serve as important tourist sites for thousands of tourists who come to this area every year. It's an opportunity for, to build the economy and the infrastructure of the diocese, but also they stand as a living testament to the Catholic faith in the city. The history of the diocese has long been shaped by the movement of peoples, especially migrants and refugees. The region that is now the Diocese of El Paso fell under numerous jurisdictions, first under dioceses in New Spain, then to Santa Fe, then to San Antonio, until finally becoming its own diocese in 1914. The first bishop of the diocese was the Jesuit, 
Anthony Joseph Schuller. Now, he was bishop during an extreme period of anti-clericalism in Mexico. To flee the brutality of the Mexican government, many priests and seminarians crossed the border into El Paso. One priest, a future saint, Father Pedro de Jesus Maldonado, was a seminarian whom Bishop Schuller ordained to the priesthood in St. Patrick's Cathedral in 1918. Pedro Maldonado was born in the area of Chihuahua City in Mexico and was one of seven children. When he was 17 years old, he entered the diocesan seminary and was known very much for his piety. Once, after having completed the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, he told the rector of the seminary, I have thought of always having my heart in heaven and in the tabernacle. And he brought faith and piety to El Paso when he came to work as a priest. And this man served for 19 years during a time of tremendous persecution within the Church of Mexico. He had to live in hiding most of the time. At one point, he was arrested and beaten and put before a mock firing squad, ready, aim, fire. Then he was deported from Mexico to El Paso. He recovered from his injuries and told the bishop, I have to return. He served one more year, was arrested again in 1937 and beaten to death. Around the year 2000, he was among 25 martyrs who were canonized by Pope John Paul. They're known as the Mexican martyrs. The Diocese of El Paso also has the distinction of being the first Catholic diocese in the United States to be headed by a Hispanic bishop, Bishop Patrick Flores, who later went on to become the Archbishop of San Antonio. His life history is reflective of the life histories of many Hispanic Catholics in Texas. His father was a janitor and he himself worked temporarily as a farm worker before his studies for the priesthood. As bishop, he worked not only to establish Hispanic ministry, but also to raise the profile of the Mexican-American population in Texas and to help the Catholic Church in the United States recognize the spiritual gifts offered by Mexican-American Catholics and others of Hispanic origin. Throughout its long history, the Mother Church and the seat of apostolic authority for the bishops of El Paso has been St. Patrick's Cathedral. Construction on St. Patrick's Cathedral began when the cornerstone was laid on July 31st, 1914, the feast day of St. Ignatius. After three years of construction, the building was dedicated on Thanksgiving Day in 1917. Well, I have to say for me personally, it was love at first sight when I saw this beautiful cathedral I felt so privileged to be able to serve in this church. Obviously, I already felt privileged to serve the community of the people of God, the church itself. This church speaks very well of the faith of the people. This is a neo-Romanesque cathedral. It has a definite American character about it, but it is absolutely inspired and fashioned after the classical influence of proportion. So when we approach the building, we know right away that this is a really important building. And in fact, it is the most important church of the diocese. It's the cathedral. There are clusterings of threes everywhere. So three arches as you enter into the main doorways, three windows above that, clustering of three sets of windows on each side of the bell towers. And this makes us think of St. Patrick's teaching about the Trinity. The cathedral is full of very fine craftsmanship um, and a number of pieces of artwork from various media. So there is painting, there's mosaic, there's statuary and stained glass. On the exterior of the cathedral is a mosaic of, featuring the patron, St. Patrick. This is a really fitting patron, not only because of the Irish population, but because St. Patrick was a bishop. That green allusion to the bishop is picked up in the architecture throughout the church. And so on the cathedra itself, there's green marble. 
The stained glass windows also instruct us in the church. Two notable stained glass windows are of Christ's teaching and then of the coat of arms of Pope Benedict XV, under whom this cathedral was built. Because of this relationship, as well as Our Lady of Guadalupe being the patroness of the Americas, uh, she holds a special place in the heart of the cathedral. And there is a 300-year-old icon of Our Lady of Guadalupe housed in a special shrine. The cathedra, or chair, inside St. Patrick's Cathedral represents Bishop Mark Seid's authority as the Apostle of El Paso. Here in El Paso, when people ask, I tell them, I'm a Norteño, which usually means to people that you're from the northern border of Mexico. Well, in my case, it means that I'm from the northern border of the United States. I came from Wisconsin, southeast Wisconsin, from the country west of Milwaukee. My father was mostly of Germanic origins, and my mother, mostly Irish. I was the first of what became 10 children. I was a kid who was full of questions. The questions that I had were very often about the ultimate things, uh, about why are we here? What is our purpose? Where is God and what is God like? From the earliest time I can remember, I thought that maybe priesthood would be an exciting vocation, something that I would enjoy doing. And at the end of high school, I said, you know, I still would like to look into this anyway. I'm not sure, but I, but I think it's gonna be nagging at me unless I pursue it. Learned about this seminary in Dallas. I went down during my senior year, and it's one of these experiences that I think probably most people never have in their life, and I certainly haven't since but I walked into the doors of this place and I said, this is where I belong, this seminary. When my father left, uh, I was only 22 years old. He actually left home in 1976. So just after I graduated from college that, that summer, he had been going through some very difficult times emotionally. And at that time, I actually was having to ask the question, should I just stay home? I, who's going to support my family? I have so many younger brothers and sisters. My youngest brother was like four years old. But there's where not only my family, but our extended family, our friends, family friends came in. One was the best friend of my father growing up. He really stepped up and he pulled me aside and he said to me, you do what God wants you to do. You follow his call and do the best that you can. We'll take care of things here. That just relieved such a, a burden from me. I, I had a renewed focus on making sure that if they were doing that, for my family, then I need to give everything that I have to this calling. On May 17, 1980, Mark Seitz was ordained as a priest for the Diocese of Dallas. My ordination took place in my home parish, St. Joan of Arc, Okachi, Wisconsin, little country parish. This was the place where I began serving mass, the place where I began to lecture to where I joined the choir, where I began cantering. Uh, this was the community that our family belonged to. It was such a rich experience. I couldn't believe how joyful it was to be there with people who had played a role in my life from the time I was born. Uh, family, parish community, people from the Diocese of Dallas, like brother seminarians who came and sang at the Mass and so on. We probably also incorporated into the Mass the first Spanish song that was ever sung in that church in Okachi, Wisconsin. When I was ordained, 
I received a letter from the bishop that said, I would like you to go to Good Shepherd Parish in Garland, Texas, and I would like you to begin the first Spanish mass in, in that parish. And within several weeks of beginning that mass, even with my tremendous limitations, uh, there, th the church was about full. The Spanish-speaking community, primarily Mexican immigrants, they lived very quietly under the radar to the point where even people who lived in the same town didn't know they were there. Uh, but when we began to reach out to them, it unearthed a tremendous hunger, tremendous need, and how loving and patient they were, how grateful for my feeble efforts and that of, of the parish. Uh, that's the only thing that has gotten me through all of these years. In January 2010, Pope Benedict XVI named Bishop Seitz an auxiliary bishop for the Archdiocese of Dallas. After years of service in Dallas, in 2013, Pope Francis named him the next bishop of the Diocese of El Paso. I had celebrated a confirmation in Dallas. I noticed when I left the confirmation that there was a message on my cell phone. It was the third anniversary of my ordination as a bishop. I noticed it was from Washington, and uh, then I realized it was from the nunciature. So I called back, uh, it's a Saturday, nuncio isn't in. And so I'm dying, what does he want? So finally I was able to get through to the um, nuncio uh, some hours later, and he, he told me that the Holy Father, Pope Francis, who had just been elected the month before, had named me the Bishop of El Paso. First of all, feeling of inadequacy, unworthiness. I, I was concerned about whether I was the right pick, but okay, hold, the Holy Spirit's supposed to be involved in this process, right? He won't hopefully let me down. I'd never been to El Paso. I had often said, you know, I've seen most of the parts of Texas now, except for El Paso, for far west Texas, Someday I should go visit El Paso. My father had been apart from the family for the better part of 40 years until the last two years. The first event in my life after the, my graduation from college that he was present at was my installation here. And that was kind of the beginning of a gradual healing of the rift. So that's uh, been a, a true blessing too after so many years. I suppose it, it is a bit of a reversal of the uh, story of, of the prodigal son. <laughs> to me, another sign of God's faithfulness because we had come to the point where we thought he would never be a factor in our lives again. Since becoming bishop, Bishop Seitz has led his people as a true shepherd becoming a prophetic voice within the American hierarchy on issues relating to immigration and justice for migrant workers. El Paso means the paths. People have always gone back and forth here. People from Mexico have often sought refuge here. And in fact, we have religious who came here during persecutions of the church and ended up settling here and are with us to this day. This is kind of the nature of our place. And because we are an immigrant community, perhaps, we also understand what would move people to leave their home and to go to another place. So there's this fundamental kind of sense of compassion towards those who are fleeing their homes in Central America. We get it. Most of this community really understands what would move them to, to leave everything and, and come here. Despite our limitations here economically and so on, the people of El Paso have opened their hearts and their arms. I think that in human beings, there is a fundamental, very base, fear of the other and 
Perhaps the internet has not been our friend in this regard because people who are who have this emptiness in their life will often seem to fill it by identifying with with very radical groups that tie into that sense of alienation and hatred. Love conquers that hatred Hating people back will not resolve this issue, will not make it better. One of the things I like to say about El Paso is it's a place where it's impossible to live the faith abstract. But in a certain sense, the faith is particularly uh, clear in its demands here uh, with the needs that we have been confronted with. Either you accept uh, that Christian calling to love and to serve and to forgive and to be part of the community of the church, or you're not really a full part of the, of the work of Jesus Christ. My message is, uh, wherever you are on that spectrum, there's never a time when you can say, I'm not called to love. I'm not called to be compassionate. I'm not called to care for those who are in need and those who are suffering. What a great privilege we have here in El Paso to live this faith every day. These events have given us an opportunity, not just me, but the entire people of God here. And in a way, God has taken these challenges and this evil that has shown itself here and in some ways turned it into a blessing.